Okay, everyone, let's formally start. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everyone and good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is the third session that we're going to proceed. Okay, so let's uh, first of all have a little bit of overview of the past uh, session that we, uh, the previous session, a little bit of overview of that, and then we will proceed to the this, uh, this uh, session number three contents okay so in the last one uh, last uh, session we looked at uh, the ps4 and epc call flows primarily the mobility management call flow so uh, the time we uh, we concluded our session we were done with the mobility management and today we'll be doing with this session management flows okay so uh, what we had was uh, um, an overview of the first uh, session then we looked at the attached procedure uh, and we saw how the attached procedure for 2g uh, and 3g was a little bit different as compared to 4g then we took a look at the authentication function how authentication was being done from the hlr and hss then we had a look at uh, different uh, the keys which were used in 2G and 3G. So in 2G we had triplet, 3G we had quinter, and EPC we had uh, four authentication keys. And uh, and how it was in 2G it was single direction, in 3G and 4G it was bi directional. And then we looked at the detached procedure and we discussed that uh, there are three uh, three ways in which a user can get detached. It is via MSLDM itself. The GSM can have the detached procedure. And we can also initiate detached using HLR. Uh, next, we saw what was the state and what was the difference between explicit and implicit detach. Then we moved on towards the routing area update. I explained to you that what is the difference between periodic routing area update and a normal routing area update. And there are two types of routing area updates. One is inter-SGSN and one is intra-SGSN. And we discuss how inter SGSN works, how intra SGSN works, routing area update works. For example, if, if the same routing area within the same um, SGSN, it's called intra SGSN. And if it's a different SGSN, then it's called inter SGSN. We took a look at the 2G inter SGSN uh, procedure, how the old SGSN was involved, and how DNS was involved, if DNS is involved uh, in this flow. Next, we took a look at uh, the 3G inter SGSN uh, procedure. There was a little bit of different, like how the, the how your downlink packets are buffered in RNC. In 2G, it's buffered in SGSN, and in um, 3G, it's buffered in the RNC. So there is a little bit of extra flows for the packets to be communicated from the old RNC to the new RNC. Then we looked at the service request procedure. We discussed that how uh, the radio access bearer is assigned and there are limited uh, number of bearers that are available per node B. So a user has, so you, so a user, uh, has to get uh, the bearer released after its inactivity. Its session is maintained in the, in the SGSN and EGSN, but between SGSN and your radio and between the radio and your uh, MSSDN, it is uh, um, the radio bearer is released. And if user needs to initiate the communication again, it needs to have a service request procedure. So it's only for UMTS. And we have service request in 4G as well. So we discussed this procedure as well. Then we had a look at the mobility management flows of 4G. We discussed what is the uh, the temporary identity in 2G, 3G, PTMZ, in 4G, is Guti, what is Guti made up of, where and what sort of location information is shared, the attached procedure, where I explained that it's an attach and a create bearer is combined in 4G. Since the user uh, does, since the E node B does not have any connectivity with MSC, so it's a, a default bearer is created at the end of attached procedure. So it's a combination of the attached procedure and your creates session of create pdp if you go if you are comparing comparing it with 2g and 3g uh, then we had um, then we discussed the uh, the attached procedure the description of that i told you guys and girls to read this if there was any confusion or anything discussed we could 
uh, we can discuss it afterwards. And uh, next was the tracking area update procedure. Uh, what is the intra tracking area, the intra tracking area, when there is another entity SGW involved. So we have inter MME with SGW and inter MME without SGW change. So we discussed its uh, its flows as well uh, with the SGW change, which is a little bit easier to understand, and without SG, uh, and and without SGW change, which is uh, I mean, SGW change is a little bit complicated, and it's a lengthy uh, call flow. Uh, without SGW, it's pretty much simple, and intra tracking update is very very simple. So I hope you don't have any questions in that. In case we have any questions, you can uh, write them down in the chat box and we can discuss it at the end of this session. Okay, so uh, without SGW change, then we looked at the recharge procedure in 4G as well. Again, it's an, it can be an implicit or an, an explicit detached in how uh, the different NEs are involved. Since in attached, we have bearer, require, bearer is created. So in detached, obviously, apart from being detached, your bearer is also disconnected and bearer is also removed in SCW and PGW. Okay, so this was a bit, a little bit of overview uh, of uh, the previous session. And now we will officially start the session of uh, session management, which is of uh, actually the content of this. Okay, so in session number three, we are primarily going to cover the session management flows. Okay, uh, a little bit of concepts. I will give you a brief introduction of this concept because they, these are involved in your call flows. So first is the DT, direct tunneling concept. Direct tunneling is actually something on which your uh, 4G SA architecture is based. If you remember, I explained to you that your uh, PGW was your PGW and some portion of your PGW and SGW was divided to make uh, PGW and uh, SGSN and GGSN uh, was broken down into create another entity known as SGW. So the primarily function was there so that MME is responsible for handling your uh, signaling and SGW responsible for handling your uh, the User plane. So this can also be done in 3G as well. And the concept is called a direct tunnel. So what happens is that in direct tunneling, your RNC directly communicates with SGSN for in the control plane. For example, the mobility management, you have any signaling change, any update procedures. However, when you're performing browsing, you're doing uplink and downlink, it, it's a direct communication between RNC and GGSN. So SGSN is not involved. Yes, SGSN is updated by the GGSN and RNC. For example, if your location is changing and all that, but the direct communication, the red link is between GGSN and RNC. The purpose of that is uh, that because uh, your high throughput is usually required in user plane as compared to signaling plane. So if you need to do any expansions, if DT is not involved, then we need to expand SGSN, we need to expand GGSN as well along with expansion at the RNC level as well. So this gives one of the one of the advantages, there are many advantages, is that you 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 separate the SESN so that if if you have any throughput limitation, handling bandwidth handling limitation, you just need to perform upgrade at GGSN level yeah. only. Apart from that, there is a I mean SESN is an a, is an additional hop. Uh, when you're communicating. So we remove the additional hub, which obviously improves the latency and your communication is, is improved. And, and obviously this is the basis on which your 4G architecture is created. Okay, so a little bit of limitations like uh, roaming subscribers do not use DT. If GGSN supported GTP V0, it's not done. If any of these three NEs do not support the DT function, RNC, CSS, yes, and GGS, and it is not done, then there are some com, uh, some some complications in the billing as well. So uh, based on that, it is not used. Okay, and and its advantages and benefits we already discussed. So scalability is improved, and it's a basis of 4G architecture.
Okay, the other, the other concept was SGSM pool. SGSM pooling is another concept that we will study and discuss later on with uh, details. And, um, but a little bit of overview what SGSM pool is, is that there are different BLCs and RNCs are usually connected with one SGSM. So when you move from the coverage of one SGSN to an RNC and BSC uh, in the coverage of another SGSN, what we already studied is that the user performs inter SGSN routing area update. SGSN pool is a concept in which your each RNC and each BSC is connected with every SGSN. So there, are, there is no inter SGSN routing area. It's always intra SGSN routing area update and the user is always latched to the same SGSN. So it helps in uh, in decreasing the 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 signaling load, for example, if you are communicating with one SGSN community with another SGSN for the context and all that information, and you have a redundancy available as well. For example, if one SGSN goes down, the SGSN can handle the traffic and the user request from other RNCs and BNCs. The detail flows we will discuss in later sessions. Similar to SGSN pool, when we are using MME pool, we have MME pool as well. And the concept here is that your each A node B is connected with every MME in the network. So that if one MME goes down, the A node B continues to be served by the other MME. Plus, there is a reduce in signaling if the user moves from the coverage of one MME to the uh, coverage of another MME. Okay, so it's equivalent to that. There is a GGSN pool concept as well. Uh, that is a more of a GGSN load balancing, uh, but you can call it GGSN. Uh, pool as well and there what you do is that since SGSN is selecting a GGSN based on APN so you can add multiple APNs and you can ensure that uh, we have uh, that it is done based on a priority based on a certain weight and if one GGSN goes down the other GGSN keeps on serving the subscribers the new subscriber the existing one obviously have to be, have to be disconnected so it's not that much of a pooling advantage but it's more of helpful for redundancy availability. Okay, so gateway pool selection, it's based on MZ. It can be based on the percentage and it can be based on the weight and priority, which I already discussed that this can be done when you're selecting a GGSN or a TGW. So it's either based on MZ, a certain percentage or weight and priority. Okay, uh, charging, we already discussed this, the G interface uh, for UGW and as well as for uh, USN as well, as you just will have G interface that we're communicating with charging. So offline charging is over G interface and online charging is over G interface. This is something we already discussed. Okay, there are uh, some more concepts that, uh, that we will discuss afterwards, but we'll have an introduction is a content based Charging, this is one of the functionality of the GGSN or the PGW is a deep, a deep packet inspection, which I mentioned earlier. So there is a concept uh, inside the GGSN that you can have a content based charging as well. For example, uh, you have, uh, okay, a sound difference between online charging and offline charging is online charging is real time. It is being done online, okay? Offline charging is you create a CDR, you send to the CG, then CG then uh, based on the CD of the CG, you, the post-processing of the CDR is done and then you are charged. So uh, pre previously what used to happen was that the postpaid used to be charged as part of offline because you, you, you used to have uh, uh, a bill at the end of the month. And, and it was not pre-charged. It was charged once your bill was generated. So it was being charged uh, uh, via CG CDRs and your prepaid was being charged via geo interface via online charging. But now both of them have been done via online charging since your postpaid packages and all that, those ensure that you have the sufficient uh, quota available. So that is the main difference between them. Okay. So content-based charging, content-based charging, like I said, that it is based on the content. So you can charge a, a user based on the certain URL that is user is using a certain IP address that the user is using certain port he is using and the base on an uplink and downlink. Okay, so you can define different tariffs based on that. 
we will discuss this uh, later when we go into how the DPI configuration and rules and filters are created. The other one is the quality of service QS. QS is, uh, or Q, uh, the term which we used in, in, in Packet Core is called uh, QCI, Quality of Service Class Identifier. And this is basically the quality of service based on which your throughput is assigned to you, or there are there is an imitation of the of the uplink and outlink speed which a user can attain. So there are two types of um, two types of um, policing, or one is the aggregate maximum bit rate, which is called the AMBR, and then there is the guaranteed bit rate. If you remember, uh, I told you that there is. Um, there is a default bearer and there, there is a dedicated bearer. So default bearer is always assigned an AMBR. Uh, however, if you need some guaranteed quality of service, then you are assigned a dedicated bearer. So GBR and MBR are used for dedicated bearer, whereas AMBR is used for default bearers. And even in AMBR, there is an APN AMBR which gives that what maximum bit rate can be provided by a certain APN in a PGW. And then there is a UE AMBR. UE AMBR is that what maximum bit rate a user, a user equipment can attain maximum. For example, if you have multiple bearers established, so there is a limit to the maximum number of AMBR that you can attain. So these two concepts will obviously come afterwards when we discuss DPI. Yeah. Uh, service awareness, similar to DPI, when we configure different rules in uh, PGW or GGSN, there are layer three and layer four rules which work on your IP address, on your port and the protocols. So if you have a certain rule defined for a protocol, so we define it in the layer three and layer four. Layer seven is basically where you work on the application layer, where if you want to create a rule for a certain URL, you need to create for a specific uh, protocol and service. So those rules are created at layer seven. So SA stands for service awareness. So this is a functionality of the BGW. And when we will discuss the rules and filters, we will discuss it in more detail how this is done. Service redirection is another, uh, in a, another function of uh, GGSN. What it does is that you can, you have an option of a captive portal and you have an option of a web proxy. What captive portal does is that uh, you will access one specific URL, for example, XYZ. What GGSN does is that it will have a configuration that you need to re be redirected to a certain portal. So your request will be redirected to a portal, portal.com. For example, uh, you are using an internet service of an ISP and maybe your quota is expiring. So ISP has the option of maybe triggering you to a page that reminds you that, okay, you have, a, you have used 80% of your quota and 20% quota is left. Or maybe uh, this is uh, this happens. Your quota is exhausted, so it will not allow you to go to that website. It will go to your portal, which will tell you that okay, uh, you don't have any quota available, so we cannot allow you to use the service. So the captive portal works like this. So it will be redirected to that portal, and if it's just an informationary message, then you have an option to continue the service. Once you continue the service, then GGSN realizes that okay, you have agreed to continue, and then you will be directed towards the desired website that you were requesting to get access to. And then you have the normal HTTP communication with that website, okay? So this is how the captive portal works and it's a function of CGSM. The other one is a web proxy. I'm pretty sure uh, most of us must be aware how a web proxy works. So what the GGSN does is that GGSN, instead of directly communicating with a web server, GGSN communicates via a proxy server. What a proxy server does is that it changes your source IP address. So if there are any any websites that require you to be to access them from a certain IP addresses, because if you are assigned a dynamic IP addresses, then maybe that user may not be allowed to access that web server. They will have a firewall installed here that will ensure. So you will have to be redirected for a certain server. You'll have to be redirected to a proxy server. The proxy server will change the destination and the source IP address, and then the source IP address uh, is changed, and then you are provided access to this web server, and then we have a response on that, and then it again changes the destination IP address, and you come back with the response. Okay. 
so various policy url filtering and all that can be uh, can be done in the proxy uh, server and ggsn has this functionality available that it can uh, it can route you to a certain proxy server which will then allow you to have access to this yes this can be done in ggsn uh, there is a function a feature available and then you have based on those commands and based on the source ip address and based on your destination ip address ggsn can can do the re direction to a specific uh, proxy server or a specific uh, uh, for example there is one uh, there is one new concept that we recently installed is a url filtering server so ggsn has the ability of uh, routing all your requests to a url filtering so url filtering will be a proxy server and url filtering will then decide that okay this url is allowed and this url is not allowed and then based on that the, the url filtering will allow you to go to the specific yeah. website so how it is done we will do we will look into this when you look into the configuration we have a set of functions available we have a set of commands available and based on that uh, the redirection to the proxy server or any other server can be done in ggsn okay so now we return back to the session um, management flows okay the session management is responsible for uh, establishing monitoring a packet tunnel from ms to ggsn and allow specific resources like ip address quality of service the important concepts are pdp context activation modification and deactivation okay so uh, this is how uh, uh, your um, session management actually works okay uh, your request goes to your bts from bts to bsc bsc to your sgs and the sgs and then identifies which dns is uh, which uh, dns identifier which ip address is serving the specific apn and then the request goes to your EGSM. If you remember, uh, we we discussed that there is an internal DNS whose so responsibility is to keeping a track of the APN and the GGSN. So your APN, each APN entry has a GGSN IP address corresponding to it, so that when you when a user brings in an APN, the SGSN knows that which GGSN do I need to route this to. Okay, APN has two parts. I mean, uh, what we uh, usually address, what you look after is the APN operator identifier, like it's uh, Zong or it's CM Park or it's internet or something like that. But there is also in, in configuration point of view, there is also network identifier as well, which identify the which network does this belong to. For example, there is an operator A. Operator A will have the same APN internet and there is an operator B, they will also like to have the same uh, APN as internet. So what differentiates them is the APN network identifier. How this is constructed, I will uh, explain it to you. At this level, you just need to know that the APN is usually APN and I plus OI. From handset, from the MSISDN, usually you can figure the operator identifier. And then it's the responsibility of the SDSN to construct, to add the network identifier to it so the DNS can easily identify. Okay, so... Um, let's just check uh, what is let's just check how this is uh, created an apn structure is apn network identifier plus operator identifier okay so network identifier will be your uh, like uh, mnc abc dot okay yes so network identifier is going to be this part uh, your actual your actual APNs. <laughs> Sorry, I got uh, a bit confused in this. Uh, what the user brings is the network identifier, and the operator identifier is something that is uh, added by the your operator. Okay, so what happens is that uh, uh, so what happens here is that this is the part that your MSIDN brings. And this is the part that is appended by your SDSN. So this is operator identifier. So operator identifier is your mobile network code, mobile country code. For example, if you're using it in JAZZ, it's 410001, and then you have a dot .gprs. So this whole construct is the APN structure that the DNS recognizes. 
So this part is what by the MSICN, and this part is what the is what your SDSN adds to it. So this is the network identifier, and this is the operator identifier. Right. So okay, the PDP context is uh, PDP context contains all the information needed to transfer user information. You once your PDP context created, so you are able to perform the uplink and downlink. During PDP creation you are provided different information like routing information, like you're provided the quality of service, you're providing charging ID, you are provided the IP address and other information. And then the PDP context exists in your MSICN, in your SGSN, in your GGSN, in your RNC and PSS. Uh, this we already discussed, what are the different states? You can have an active PDP and you can have an inactive PDP. Okay, so, Inactive is in an inactive state, obviously you cannot transmit any data. You have to activate your PDP and in active state, you can transmit uh, the data. Okay, so different things that you will look into when you are looking into the PDP request is that you get a PDP type. PDP type is basically what type of PDP you require, whether it's an IPv4 session, you need an IPv6 session, you need a triple P session. And then there is a PDP address. So what uh, usually these are uh, a bit uh, confusing. Uh, these terminology are confused at times. So what is a PDP type? Order? So PDP type is the type of the PDP, IPv4, V6, PP, and the PDP address is actually the IP address. So it can be two types of addresses. We already discussed this static IP, which is allocated by the operator uh, via the HSS, or it's a public IP. Again, this is assigned by the HSS or HLR. And then there is a dynamic IP address, which is assigned by your DGSN, your DHCP, or radio server against your TPN. Quality of service is a group of parameters that can define the network ability, like bit rate, downlink, uplink, transmission, reliability. And it's an end to end concept. For example, if quality of service is going from MSID and still your DGSN, the quality of service is going to be the same. It isn't going to be like this that your um, uh, the handset uh, is requesting a different quality of service and the GGS and product protocols so it has to be an end to end same concept. Okay, and uh, a detailed quality of service like preemption capability and preemption vulnerability, these are advanced concepts, we will look to them afterwards. Okay, so this is an example how your, uh, okay. Uh, the, okay, so the DNS which have GGS and IP the same, which will do the resolution. No, no. Uh, uh, there are two types of DNS. One is internal DNS, where is external DNS. This function, GG, APN to GGS and IP is your internal DNS. And the other one is uh, your external DNS. Yes, uh, uh, the disadvantage of joining um, Zoom by uh, my personal account is that we'll have six minutes. I will confirm, I will try to access that link, uh, the one, the other one. If I'm able to access that, then I'll ask you guys to join that. Otherwise you can join this link again, okay? I'll try my best to ensure that that link starts working again. And if that works, then we won't be having this issue. Okay, so, so this is how it works. Your MSSDN, your handset has multiple APIs. You have internet, you have BAP, you have MS. So when you create a PDP, you want to use a specific service, you will send a PDP request to SDSN carrying that APN. From SDSN will then check with the DNS, okay, if, if, if it's APN1, which is the GGSN that is serving it, if it's APN2, GGSN2, if it's APN CGS. For example, if you're using a normal internet APN, then what it will do is that it will route you to a specific to a GGSN server that is providing internet service. If you requested an MMS service, although it's an obsolete, but it was a very good example, MMS service, then it will route you, it will not route you to, it will uh, 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 route you to a GGSN that has the MMS uh, APN configured that has the connectivity with the MMSC server. For example, maybe GGSN1 does not have the MMSC connectivity, only GGSN2 has. So it will always give the GGSN2 IP address against the APN2. And if you are using uh, app, uh, uh, app proxy server and the, uh, and the APN is WAP, so maybe this GGSN is the one that is connecting with a proxy server. The other two are not. So your request will all be routed towards GGSN number three. So based on the APN, you can have different GGSNs or you can have 
all the adjacent serving all the APNs. Right now, in today's day, uh, usually all the GGSNs are pro are serving all the APNs. But usually, when you have the corporate APNs configured with them, then what you ensure is that it's very complicated. You have to have a dedicated routing and dedicated IP. So you assign just one GGSN to ensure that the, all your uh, corporate APNs are being served by a single GGSN. So this usually happens in today's operators as well. Okay, so if it's a normal internet and it's, uh, so your request is going to go to your GGSN from GGSN, SGSN to GGSN or to go to the internet. And even if you're going on roaming, your APN is the same, so it will be, is going to be the same. But, for example, uh, you have configured here that all your the requested service of the API that you're carrying is uh, being served by this GGSN. So obviously your session is going to be uh, terminated on the uh, on your local SGSN, but the local SGSN is then going to send the request to your remote GGSN because this GGSN is handling this VPN tunnel or is handling this specific proxy server, it is handling this specific IP, specific service. Uh, which is being served for this APN. Okay, so if it's an APN that is configured on all the GGSN, then the, then it's going to be a straightforward. If it's a specific APN, then it will be routed to the specific GGSN. Okay, so the activation procedure, this is the PDP activation procedure for 2G. Uh, whenever you need to use a data service, you will send an activate PDP request to the, to the 2G SGSN and you will carry the APN, that which APN activation service is required. Okay, then if it is, this is configurable that you need to perform security function or not. So this is mentioned in dotted line, if security function is required, fine, if not required, it's okay. Based on this APN, what is internally done is that SGSN will check that, okay, this user is allowed to use the service, the area that user is bringing uh, the request from, is it allowed because we can have area restriction as well. We can check that, okay, the APN the user is bringing, is it a correct APN or not? Based on the attach profile, it will match whether the APN is correct or not. And based on all that, all that information, once that is done, um, you will, the SGSN will then send a create PDP contest request to which GGSN? Again, we discussed this, that SGSN will check from DNS that which IP address of the GGSN is serving this APN. So it will create, send a create PDP contest request where again, the APN is going to be carried along with your MZ, MSI, SDN. Um, a lot of information is carried in this. Uh, in the next session or the next session after that, we'll go to look into the presses and then we will discuss that what is the exact content that is carried in each of these signal message. Uh, for now, just understand how the call flow works. And then inshallah, uh, in the next session, we will discuss it in detail, what content is, is, is carried in each of these messages. So GGSM will internally check that APN, the rockets, uh, the APN, okay, the, it will have an IP address assigned. Uh, an IP pool is going to be configured with this APN, so it will select an IP from that. It will check a charging, how much uh, a charging ID, ID is assigned, any quality of service that needs to be assigned, that is assigned. And all that information is then sent in the PDP contact response. The main thing that is shared here is the IP address. Then the SGSN will create a context with the BSS to ensure that there is uh, BS, uh, your uh, logical link is created between your BSS and the SGSN and the quality of service that GSN provided that is available on SGSN and BSS as well. And based on that, once that is done and they are on the same quality of service, then the SGSN will send an accurate PDV contact except that will give the IP address. So at this point, you will have your IP address and then the MSSDN can start communicating directly with SGSN, GGSN for any browsing that is required. Okay, so I think uh, this session is going to, uh, okay. So 3G, 